Okay, well, that's a great pleasure to be with you because uh, I'm quite new in, uh, in the research activity field and uh, I would like to present you this uh, project I'm leading uh, since the last four years, which is called DOMEX, and it aims to find new ways to identify early domestication process uh, in animal uh, in archaeology. And um, it's a project I'm doing with lots of researchers from different fields um, in, in, in France. So, why do we need new markers of domestication? Well, before we need to agree on what is the domestication process. So now we consider that the domestication process is a continuum of intensification of the relationship between man and animal. Uh, and starting from the earliest um, adaptation of Y population to the ecological niche of uh, humans, which is generally called commensalism, synanthropism, uh, up to the animal pets, okay? And that goes through control of white population, control of captive animals, up to the husbandry. Uh, and there are different pathways to this domestication process, okay? You have the commensal one for some species. You have the competition head one, which is solely for wool, and the most common one is the prey or the directed pathway, uh, mainly for uh, ungulate herbivores. So it's the hunting pathway, basically. So in zoo archaeology, to identify domestic um, animals, we mainly use domestication syndromes that have been defined by uh, Charles Darwin in his uh, seminal book, The Variation of Animals and Plants in the Domestication. So basically, you have a different kind of traits uh, in common in all the domestic animals whatever their phylogenetic link, and they appear in different degrees, okay? In archaeology, this is mainly the body size reduction, um, the shortening of the face, or if you have ancient DNA, you can have uh, information about the coat color, change in coat color. And uh, that's um, thanks to the experiment of this um, the famous Fox Farm experiment, led by Dimitri Belyayev in the 59s. Uh, who has demonstrated that those domestication syndromes are the pleiotropic consequences of a drastic selection of behavior. So he has demonstrated that in 50 years of drastic selection of the most amenable, docile uh, silver fox, he could reproduce all these domestication syndromes uh, in, in the fox. So those Domestication syndromes, or also reduction in sex sexual dimorphisms, or phenotypic divergences, which I've been working on for quite a while, they all allow us to identify already biologically modified animals. Okay, so we're quite late in this process I was talking about previously. Okay, so my objective was to. Um, Identify earlier process and what APR used to call the cultural control, okay, and focusing on the control of movement through captivity, because captivity is the, the catalyzer of most of the domestication process for most of the animals. Okay, so then if we can identify that, we'll be able to uh, access to the earliest process of domestication, uh, which is basically make the animals, the Y population, more accessible to people. So in order to, to test the, um, the fact that captivity can leave and identify uh, morphological markers in uh, animal bones, um, we have made uh, an experiment using a uh, white uh, ovulate, the white ball, and we have um, tried to control most of the confounding factors, like genetic, uh, sex, diet, and, uh, and age, okay? So we have taken uh, 24 piglets, six months old, uh, from a very well um, understood population of white boar. And we've made two groups of the same sex ratio, and we put them in different uh, biomechanical environments. One is a, is a pen of 2,500 meters square, trees, and another one is a store. 100 meters square for all of them, for the 12. Okay. 
it's quite drastic mobility reduction. And um, to look at the effect of captivity, we have made an in vivo longitudinal study. So kind of making some data acquisition all over the globe. So from six months to 24 months, so two years old. So we made CT scans for the bone development, uh, MRI, uh, swabs for microbiome, uh, blood and muscle samples for DNA, for genetic and epigenetic, uh, and, and for stress markers. And now this collection is available for, for, study, for research. Um, so we, we're going to look at different uh, aspects of the skeletal the development, the skull, and the, the appendicular bone. But today I'm just going to talk about the appendicular bone and I'm going to look at the difference at different scale of the bone morphology from the old, overall shape up to the cellular level. Okay, using different kind of uh, methods from the latest developments in uh, image analysis and uh, morphometric analysis. So today, I'm going to make it uh, short. I'm going to present you results from uh, my uh, PhD students, Hugo Arbers, who has focused on two bones, the humerus and the calcaneum, okay? Because they're well preserved in archaeology, okay? Uh, and also because they can allow us to infer uh, locomotive behavior in, in archaeology, okay? But also because they are complementary, okay? Because the calcaneum is the football from the forelimb, so it's kind of more uh, functionally res restricted, while the, I think it's the forelimb uh, humerus is, um, could be involved in other kind of activity like habitat for aging or social interaction. So that's why they, they complement it. So to look at the overall, to capture the overall morphology of those two bones, uh, we use a geometric morphometric approach, so we combine points, you know, in red, in different topographic area of the bone, semi landmark uh, around the articulation surfaces, and points, the green one, all over the surfaces. Okay, so that's kind of to capture most of the complexity of the bone because we are looking after, or we are looking for very minute uh, uh, shape differentiation, and to um, look at. The microstructural level of the, of the humerus, so like the cortical thickness, we use a method called, called uh, the morphometric mapping. So basically, from the CT, we take the surface of the perios, okay, and the surface of the medulla surface. And this that gives you a, a, a cylinder, and you, you cut it and you unroll it. So you obtain this uh, landscape of thickness, okay? looking at the, the values, the distance between those two surfaces, okay? And then you standardize it using different uh, generalizability model to make the map, the cortical thickness map of each of the bones comparable in a statistical environment. Okay, so that's it for the, for the methods. So along with those experimental specimens, uh, we've also collected lots of uh, comparative material uh, wide, different wide population, including the, the control population from which the pigment has been taken from, uh, some mesolithic um, white ore, okay, it's kind of standard for pre neolithization pre-domestication, some captive German white ore, and some different kind of breeds of uh, pigs. Right. <clears throat> so this is the, um, the results of the um, Capcanium. So this it's only for uh, adult specimens. Okay, we didn't look at all the, the, the material, but this is uh, all the adult uh, data sets. So this is PCA. So we're looking at variation in, at different uh, axes. Okay, and this is the um, the factors explaining this shape variation. Okay, uh, lifestyle, genetic. I can't see anything. Lifestyle, genetic. Uh, sex and age, okay, for different axes. So, um, this is the variation. Uh, in brown, you have the non captive white boar. In pink, you have the different domestic breeds. And circled in red, you have the experimental specimens, okay? So, we can see that the main, the main axis of variation is driven by domestication, but it's genetically driven, okay? 
And um, so the recitation has created a variation that's way beyond the norm of reaction of, of white ball. But we can look at, uh, at the white ball level that captivity uh, has created a divergence, and we also have a divergence of the mesolithic uh, specimens. So if we just look at the morphospace of the white ball, excluding all the pigs, so you can really see that captivity of our experimental specimen as well as for our German um, specimens really diverge, and you also have a divergence of the mesolithic white ball, as I told you. So if we look at the, the shape deformation, this calcanium, okay, this is the representation of this shape deformation along this axis, okay, from uh, the control population up to the, to the captive. Uh, specimen. You can see that the deformations are located mainly on the tuberous, the tuberosity of the calcaneum, and with a shrinking, and uh, uh, on the sustentaculum tali area, okay? Which means that captivity has created uh, a change in the traction of the bone, and uh, also um, a change in the sideways uh, movement inward and outward uh, of, the, of this bone. Okay, so that's pretty um, encouraging. Oh, sorry. Um, so two, two other things uh, about this result. So, um, okay, why there is this divergence of the mesolithic specimens? Hypothesis is like more likely there were different habitats and different kind of selective pressures on those specimens. And what's interesting to note is that. We can see much differences between our white ball that have been raised in a pen and the one that have been raised in a stall. Okay, so it's supposed that um, either the pen or the stall create the same range of um, locomotive behavior. Okay, so the component explaining this divergence are somewhere else. It's perhaps the loss of um, habitat for aging, uh, social interaction, predation. There's something else that's going on. And about the Mesolithic white balls, well, I know that was what I was talking about, sorry. So, um, but it's also because those Mesolithic white balls are much older uh, and probably much bigger. So this is something we need to explore further. Um, so in terms of development, we can't see much more, much differences between the pen and the stall in terms of body weight gain. Is it pretty pretty alike. As you can see, those, those growth are, are very similar. But if we look at the development of the shape of the calcaneum through what we call uh, allometric growth, the change of shape along the sides of the growth, basically, uh, if there was no differences in terms of development between the one that has lived in the pen and the one that lived in the stall, the lines would be parallel. Or we can see that there is a strong, significant interaction. So it seems that captivity disrupts the developmental program uh, of the calculator. So that's pretty encouraging. So let's go to the, um, the results of the cortical thickness. Um, so this is the result, again, okay, it's a PCA on the thickness values of our maps, okay? Um, the data set is a bit smaller because the research is still uh, ongoing. But you still have the modern white ball, no mesolithic here. Uh, different breeds of, um, of pigs, some free ranging one here. And in green, we have our experimental specimens. Okay? Again, the explaining uh, factors again, mobility, genetic, uh, sex, and age. And um, so you can see that here, there is still this main differentiation between wild and domestic, but this time, this is mainly due to functional uh, constraints, okay? Genetic is not as important compared to, to the calcaneum shape, okay? So that's very interesting. So the differences are pretty observable on those two uh, maps, okay? So uh, domestic these have a thinner cortical uh, bone, okay, slightly thinner compared to white bone, and you can see more, more yellow here, okay, and also interestingly, you have a different pattern, pattern of uh, emphasis, okay, 
more uh, um, thicker uh, bicellist uh, indices compared to pigs, and smaller uh, triceps indices compared to pigs. Okay, and the captive specimens are in between this pattern, and you can see here that their cortical thickness is thinner. Uh, and more uh, thickness of the triceps. Okay, so I need to, to rush. I need to rush. So what we'll do now, so that's very encouraging. So we have for both um, factors uh, strong evidence that it works. We can track those changes quantitatively. Okay, so we're going to adapt now the, um, the protocol to fit it better to the fragmentation material of archaeology. And we're going to explore the 3D geometry of uh, trabecular architecture. And I would like to thank all those fantastic people who have helped me to do this project. Because without them, it was completely impossible. Thank you very much. Sorry for my delay.